So instead of you telling yourself no, what you can do is employ a technique like this 10 minute rule. 10 minutes of doing what psychologists call surfing the urge. Why do we do things against our better judgment? I mean, this is an age old question. When we know what to do, why don't we just do it? And particularly in, in today's uh, age where we have the world's information at our fingertips, we don't have the excuse of not knowing what to do anymore. Who doesn't know basically how to lose weight? What we're lacking is the ability to follow through. We're lacking the ability to avoid distraction. Getting ahead in life is not just about doing the right, right things. It's about avoiding not doing the wrong things. So let's start with defining what we mean by distraction. So the best way to understand what distraction is, is to understand what it is not. So the opposite of distraction is not focus. The opposite of distraction, if you look at the entomology of the word, word the opposite of distraction is traction. They both come from the same Latin root, meaning trahare, which means to pull. Traction is any action that pulls you towards what you want to do, things that you do with intent. The opposite of traction is distraction, anything that pulls you away from something that you didn't plan to do, or th that you plan to do, something that you are not doing with intent. We have two things that move us towards traction and distraction. We have what's called an external trigger or an internal trigger. External trigger is what kind of everybody blames on distraction, right? It's the pings, the dings, the rings, anything in your environment that prompts you towards traction or distraction. Now, they're not inherently bad. These tools are not somehow evil. If a notification on your phone says, hey, it's time to wake up and hit the gym, or it's time to go to that meeting, or it's time to do the thing you plan to do, it's moving you towards traction. So those are the external triggers, but it turns out, even though we love to blame those things, we think that that is the root cause of the problem, uh, in fact, the psychology of distraction goes much, much deeper. That most distraction, it turns out, is not spurred by the external triggers at all. Most distraction does not start outside of us, but rather starts from within. That the root cause of why we become distracted is because we feel these internal triggers, these uncomfortable emotional states that we seek to escape. So if we're gonna answer Plato's question of why do we get distracted, why do we do things against our better judgment, we have to start one layer deeper with first principles of why do we do anything? What's the nature of human motivation? And when, when you think about it, most people will tell you some version of carrots and sticks, that it's about the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. This is Freud's pleasure principle. Yeah. But neurologically speaking, that's not true. That in fact, we do not do things in the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. That neurologically speaking, we only do things for one reason, and that is to avoid discomfort. Physiologically, we know this is true. If you uh, go outside and it's cold, that's not comfortable. What do you do? You put on a coat. And when you go back inside, now it's too hot, that's not comfortable, you take it off. If you're hungry, you feel hunger pangs, you eat. And when you're stuffed, oh, that doesn't feel good, you stop eating. So physiologically, we feel this all the time. This is called the homeostatic response. The same rules apply with psychological sensations, not just with physiological sensations. So when you're feeling lonely, check Facebook. When you're uncertain, you Google. When you're bored, check the news, check sports scores, check Reddit, Pinterest, whatever. All of these things cater to these uncomfortable sensations. So that means if all human behavior is spurred by a desire to escape discomfort, that means time management is pain management. So this was a study done by Timothy Wilson where they put people in a room and uh, they said there's nothing in this room to do except for we're gonna put a band on your arm and it's gonna be connected to a button that you can press on. This button will give you a painful electrical shock. Something like 60% of men and about 20% of women administer the shock that we are so uncomfortable doing nothing that we just want to feel something. We need some kind of sensation. This is by design. We, we have this instinct of feeling bored to prod us to go do something, to go search, for, to find better resources, to improve our lot in life. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. We form these habits by, trying to, by, by learning what provides relief. I mean, if there's one thing that our brain is incredibly good at is pattern matching. So if the brain feels discomfort and then finds something that can relieve that discomfort, that's what it forms the habit around. One of the things that people do that doesn't work is strict abstinence. Now, strict abstinence is when you tell yourself, I am not going to do that thing, right? Just say no, like Nancy Reagan told us in the 1980s. 
And it turns out that strict abstinence uh, for many behaviors backfires, particularly be behaviors that are very difficult to avoid completely. But how do you abstain from food if you're on a diet? We have to eat. How do you abstain from technology these days? I mean, it's imperative to do our jobs. We can't just say, stop using email for 30 days, you'll lose your job, you'll get fired. When we do abstain, when we tell ourselves, no, absolutely not, it's almost like pulling on a rubber band. Now, when you pull on a rubber band and you stretch it, stretch it, stretch it, stretch it, and you let go, it doesn't just go back to where you started, it ricochets even further. And that's what happens when we employ uh, strict abstinence. We tell ourselves, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, okay, fine, I'll give in. And that sensation of relieving the discomfort of telling yourself not to is itself pleasurable. This is a big reason why smokers get addicted to cigarettes. Smokers, when they, when they are mindful about the experience of smoking, they actually rate it as not pleasurable. It's stinky, it's, you know, it's not very pleasurable. There's nothing inherently pleasurable. Nicotine does make you feel a certain way, but many smokers don't actually report it makes them feel good, it just makes them feel something. What gets them to, to keep smoking is not only the physiological effects of the nicotine, what more so gets them addicted is telling themselves, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, finally I smoke, and now I'm relieved of the discomfort of having to tell myself, don't do it. So strict abstinence oftentimes backfires because when we finally do give in, we are wiring our neural circuitry to expect, oh, when I feel the discomfort of not wanting something, giving in makes it feel so pleasurable, not because the behavior itself is pleasurable, but because it relieves us of the discomfort of telling ourselves no. So instead of you telling yourself no, what you can do is employ a technique like this 10 minute rule, where here's how it works. You tell yourself that you can give in to any distraction, whether that distraction is you know, checking email when you wanna work on a big project, whether that you're tempted to Google something or, or do uh, eat that piece of chocolate cake you know you don't wanna have. You can give in to that distraction in 10 minutes. 10 minutes of doing what psychologists call surfing the urge. When, when it comes to these uncomfortable emotional states, we know that emotions don't last forever. In the moment, we think they will last forever. That's how the brain spurs us to do something about it, right? It spurs us to action by making us think, I don't wanna feel this way anymore. But logically, rationally, when we think about it, emotions are like waves. They crest and they subside. So we can surf these urges like a surfer riding a wave. So for 10 minutes, what, what I oftentimes do, I'll take out my phone, I'll say, set a timer for 10 minutes, I'll put my phone down, and my job for those 10 minutes is to simply reflect on that sensation and talk to myself the way I would talk to a good friend with self-compassion. So what many people do when they tell themselves no, when they try and not get distracted, they fit into two buckets, the blamers or the shamers. The blamers say, oh, it's my phone that got me distracted. It's Facebook, it's YouTube, it's, my, you know, it's Slacks. That thing got me distracted. The shamers, this is the category I used to fall into, say there's something wrong with me. Maybe I'm not cut out for this job. I'm lazy, I have a short attention span. There's something wrong with me, right? And we shame ourselves. And of course, that's not helpful either because where does this shame spiral lead? It causes more internal triggers, which makes us even more likely to seek a distraction to escape that uncomfortable emotional state. So how do you diffuse it? You don't become contemptuous, you become curious. So for 10 minutes, your job is to reflect on that sensation to feel that sensation with curiosity rather than contempt, or to get back to the task at hand. And nine times out of 10, by just setting that 10 minute rule and saying, I can give into that distraction, I can have that chocolate cake, I can go check you know, my email or Google, or whatever it is that I am tempted to do, but in 10 minutes. It's an incredibly effective and simple technique.